Well, there's a lot going on in this text this morning. These nativity stories are uh, magical, wondrous. We almost know them by heart. We've listened to Linus. <laughs> Speak the Luke one. <laughs> Amen. And we listened to me read the Matthew version this morning. You know that Mark doesn't have a nativity story. He just jumps in. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. John's nativity story is the word became flesh and came to live among us. But Matthew and Luke have these details, and Matthew's details really focus on the lineage of Jesus. It's important to Matthew that we understand that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. So the beginning of this chapter is the begats when we were little kids in church. Who begat who begat who? 14 generations, and then another 14 generations, and then another 14 generations gets us to Joseph, who is son of David. It's important for Matthew to locate Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures in the context of promise and deliverance of scripture, scripture fulfilled. And so Joseph has to adopt Jesus. And so Matthew has to tell us why that's important. So Matthew tells us about the virgin birth. Matthew says, Joseph is engaged to Mary. What I think we know, but let me remind us that engagement in those days was the contract. That was the legal binding contract. So now that Mary and Joseph are engaged, they're actually already husband and wife. And when he finds out she's pregnant, that means she has broken the law. Matthew tells us that Joseph is a righteous man, a just man, which is to say he keeps the law. Which is to say, when he finds out that Mary's pregnant, he is within his right, he is inside the law, he's supposed to have her stoned to death for committing adultery. Stoned to death for committing adultery. But the rabbis then are beginning to soften, and Joseph has heard kind of around the way that maybe all he has to do is divorce her. And because he loves her, and he does, he wants to divorce her quietly, not make a big stink out of it, not make a big deal out of the scandal that is surely a scandal. She's pregnant. And he didn't do it. Important to quickly note that Mary probably told Joseph in some pillow talk or some quiet conversation, I'm pregnant and the baby's not yours. But the angel says, God came over me and the pregnancy resulted. And probably Joseph didn't believe her. I mean, would you? <laughs> Don't want to take it. Just, this is, Take it a little bit to humor. Like, it, it's not exactly like he believed her. But also, to be fair, it's also not exactly like a virgin birth was a new thing in those days. Hmm, everybody goes. When, when Matthew is telling the story of this virgin conception, let's say, all of the people listening to him would have known of other stories of other virgins conceiving. Hmm, I love when I get you humming. Romulus and Remus, the twin founders of Rome, were born of the virgin Rhea Silvia. Hmm. In ancient Egypt, Ra, the sun god, was born of a virgin mother. Horus was born of the virgin Isis. The Pharaoh Roman god Attis was born of a virgin named Nana on December 25th. And by the way, that particular god was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose again. I'll just, hmm. <laughs> I'm just wanting you to know that it was not outside of a known opportunity for there to be a virgin birth. But Matthew wants to tell us about this particular one because actually Matthew wants us to understand the supernaturalness of the baby in the manger. 
when we get to that part of the story. Are you all with me? When I was a young person, I'm just directing this to the kiddos for just a second, I really had a hard time understanding how this story went with everything I was learning in science about how people got pregnant. Did God? <laughs> Did the Holy Spirit? <laughs> so if you are sitting there wondering that, young people, it's OK. <laughs> the Spirit of God came over Mary, is what the text tells us. And the Spirit of God that came over Mary is the same Spirit of God that came over creation, the same Spirit of God that hovered over the deep, the same Spirit of God that had only to breathe and to animate the humans. So I'd like us not to think scientifically about this pregnancy, but more about breath of God can do stuff. Right? Clear that up. Reverend Jackie said, no. So, so this is a love story. This is a love story. This is a story about God loving the world enough to show up in person. God loving the world enough to surround a vulnerable family with love, a houseless, poor, scandalized family, to surround them in love, to protect them with love, and this is a story about the love of Joseph and Mary. This is a love story. Joseph loves his fianced wife enough to pause and listen to the word of God in a dream and to not do the law of law of love, but to the law of law of love, to do love. He loves her enough to midwife love. He loves her enough to listen to God speak a dream in his heart and to change up what coulda, shoulda, woulda happened, rightfully so. It's a love story, and it's a theological story. Because Joseph is standing on the precipice of new ways to understand what God's love requires of us. God's love required 613 codes to keep a community safe, to keep the food kosher, to keep the blood from you know, infiltrating uh, dirty hands, to keep a community well. Uh, 613 laws to help us love each other, help them love each other. And Joseph is entering into a new theological space because God is whispering something new to Joseph's heart. It isn't about those rules, Joe. It's about love. Pretty soon in the text, Matthew's going to take us to the, to the Beatitudes, and we're going to hear, read, you have heard it say, but I say. You've heard it say, but I say. You've heard it say, stone her for being an adulterer, I say. Love her, and don't be afraid to marry her, right? You have heard it said, don't eat food of the cloven hoof, and I say everything I create is clean. Are you with me? You have heard it say, a man shouldn't lay down with a woman, with a man that way, and I say, love is love is love. Period. You have heard it say, don't talk in church, women, and I say, Mary, go preach the first sermon. You have heard it said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me, and I say, I am all the ways and all the truths and all the loves. You've heard it say, do this 10 commandments, and I say, Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself, and that's the law. Joseph is doing a new theology, a bold new theology, in which he is listening in his heart for the dream of God that actually surpasses all of those 16 codes 
and goes to mercy, goes to radical, revolutionary, fierce, and just love that keeps on loving past the rules and changes the rules with love. This season is a season fraught with family dynamics. I know you don't have any of that going on <laughs> in your house. But in ours, my dad is really sick. He's 88. He has spinal stenosis and cervical stenosis, which means his body is not doing what it used to do. He who loves to shoot pool can't use his hands. He who loves to play bid whist needs us to shuffle the cards. He can't put on his own shirt. He who used to dress us needs us to dress him. According to some kinds of law, human law, the dynamics in our family, the fraught ones I've had with my dad, sorry dad, could cause breakups that never get put back together again. Are you feeling what I, where I'm trying to go? Joseph was supposed to break up with Mary. God told him to hang in there. By every right, I could have broke up with my daddy, because he was kind of stanky and hard. But I didn't want to break up with my dad, because I want a dad. And God's law of love tells me to hang in there. And to keep on keeping on, and now my dad and I are like best of friends because we kept a new law. Not the law of human kind that says when somebody breaks your heart, you break theirs back. Not the law of modern day politics that says when somebody acts ugly, you act ugly back. Not the law of social media that says when you get dissed, you diss back, but the law of love. Ridiculous, crazy, revolutionary fierce love that says, let me try this one more time with you. I'm simply wanting us to hear the love story. Not just about a man who loves a woman. When a man loves a woman. <laughs> Not just that. But when a God loves a people Amen. that you cannot transgress enough to make God break up with you. When a family loves each other to where your child that's queer or your child that marries outside of the race or your child that's just a pain in the behind, you don't put them out of doors, you pull them deeper into your heart. Do you understand where I'm going with this? We are inhabiting a love story right here, right now. There's enough ugliness, enough fraughtness, enough unforgiveness, enough grief, enough doubt, enough hurt to break us all up and send us scurrying to our safe places to nurse our wounds. But Joseph, Joseph's story is ours. We're being told in our hearts God's dream for how we're going to be a people together who make mistakes and get forgiven, who transgress and are received, who color outside of the lines and are loved anyway, who have the capacity to set a table of forgiveness and grace for even Uncle Bob, who will say something crazy and stupid at Christmas, <laughs> but who likely needs you to see him and know him and love him anyway. I want us to be those people on a theological journey, outside of the lines, love, break the rules, love, transgressive love, border crossing, rule breaking, kindness, ferocious courage, love, fierce love that gives space enough for us to break some eggs and make some new quiche. New theologies born not of fear and judgment and how you screwed up, but theologies born of how much God can't wait to welcome us home when we're lost. 
And if that's what we're doing this holiday season, you know, we can put the virgin birth in the context of all the others. But we can put the new theology in the context of our own need to make peace with what we've been taught, to find new ways to live inside God's grace by living outside of old patterns that cause pain. How many of us got disowned growing up? Put out, shut down, left out. Oh, that's just me? OK. How many, <laughs> how many of us disappointed our families and felt like we didn't know where our place was anymore? OK. Mm -hmm. How many of us disappointed our partners and felt like we couldn't ever make it up again? How many of us feel like we disappointed God? One of our members, gay man, used to come to church all the time and tell me, I know I'm going to hell because I'm gay, but I'm coming to church anyway. How terrible is that? There's nothing we do. There's no place we go. There's nothing we can be that's outside of God's love story. Don't forget that. And extend that love to somebody else. Amen. Amen. Amen.